Good evening. Good evening. Hello. Hello and welcome. Hello. 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 Please find your seats. I see there's like one here, one here, one over there. If anyone wants, um, feel free to stand as well. You're welcome. More than welcome. Uh, yes, welcome to Coda's Craft. Uh, our semi-regular series of speakers in this space. Uh, if you want to find out more about these sorts of events, you can follow us on Twitter, Coda's Craft, or read our blog, codascraft.com. Um, very excited for tonight's speaker. You might know that Etsy runs on PHP, uh, as well as other languages, but primarily uh, the app, uh, API, webs, all PHP, um, heavily invested. Uh, and a lot of that is thanks to this man, who you, you're here tonight, you're probably familiar with his role in PHP, um, and he's here to talk about the most recent major release of PHP, Rasmus. Hello, ah, now it is. Okay, my slides, as always, are online at talks.php.net. I'm on Twitter, at Rasmus. We're gonna jump right into it. Um, PHP 7, it is fast. That is sort of the main takeaway you can leave here tonight with, it is super fast. So, you're going to want to, if you're using PHP already, you're going to want to get onto PHP 7 as quickly as you can. You might wanna wait, maybe not the .0.0, .0 .0 release, but, <laughs> .0.1 maybe you should be on it by then. <laughs> um, to be honest, Etsy will not be on the .0.1 either. It'll, it'll, it'll be a few minor releases later. Um, we can't make any changes around now. It's holiday shopping time, right? So it'll have to wait till January, February before we start. But your stuff will be at least twice as fast. Sometimes more, sometimes a little bit less. Um, and it's going to use a lot less memory. And that depends on a few things about your app itself as well. There are some things that we can't make faster. There are lots of new features as well. One main one that I really like is we have a file-backed uh, op cache now. So the opcode cache is a cache that sits between the parsing layer and the execution layer. So it's a two-pass language. We parse the PHP, the .php file itself, and turn it into a set of opcodes. And then those opcodes are fed to the executor that actually executes them. In between there, we've had an op an opcode cache for a long time that sits in shared memory, which is fine. Except if you restart PHP or if you're at on the command line doing CLI scripts in PHP, there's no point writing from CLI, writing to shared memory because the process is going to end, the shared memory segment gets shut down, it becomes a write-only cache at that point, which is not a useful cache. Um, so you can turn on a file-backed opcache, which means that you can write those opcodes, the parsed opcodes, to the file system, which helps you for web when you need to restart PHP. Um, you might be doing a, a nightly log rotation restart, for example, or maybe on deploys you're restarting. You shouldn't be, but you may be. Um, and it will repopulate the shared memory cache from the file-based cache. And if loading raw index.php is 1x time, grabbing it from shared memory is about 10 times faster. Um, grabbing it from disk is obviously going to be slower than grabbing it from shared memory, but it's about four times faster than having to reparse the raw file. So you're not gonna get shared memory opcache speeds out of it, but you're certainly going to get an increase. You enable it like this. First of all, you have to compile PHP with enable op cache file. Chances are pretty good. Your distro, if that's where you're getting your PHP from, will do that for you. Hopefully you're compiling your own. You really should be. So you can play with all these new features on your own. You set a directory in the file system where you want to cache these. This might be a RAM disk. Then it'll be even faster than 4X. My 4X measurement was actually on a real spinning disk. And you can then set a few other things here. You can set it to only use a file cache, for example, if you don't want it to write at all to shared memory. 
which in some instances, like if you're doing CGI, you may not want to try to write um, to shared memory. Same with CLI. Um, there's no point creating the shared memory one. So you can have a separate PHP CLI.ini where you tell it to only use the file-based cache. And one CLI script in PHP that you might be using already is Composer. So I did a quick little test. The first time you run Composer with no cache, it was taking 40 milliseconds. Um, then the second time I ran it, it took um, 19, right? And that, then if I turn off the cache entirely, it's 33 milliseconds. So this is what you have today. Well, you don't have it because PHP 7 is way faster than what you have today, but still, PHP 7 without any caching of Composer takes about 33 milliseconds, drops to 19 with a cache, and it's a little longer the first time you run it, obviously, because it has to actually write that cache file. Right? Not a huge deal, but you may have a lot of cron jobs and other things that are running on CLI, so it could help you quite a bit. This is what actually gets cached. So in var temp, when I ran Composer, and you may not know this, but Composer is something called a far file, which is a PHP archive, and inside that archive is a whole bunch of stuff. It seems like a very simple one file PHP script, but it isn't actually. It's built out of all these different files, as you can see, and that's all smushed together into this far file. But when we execute it, we have to split all this stuff apart, and when we see an include, we have to have something to include. So actually, it gets split apart uh, when it's running within PHP, and, and not an opcache as well has to keep track of each of these individually. So you see the whole thing split out, and you see these .bin files. And in theory, you could distribute these .bin files to your deploy box or to your production boxes and stuff. I wouldn't recommend it. It's, it's a bit version dependent, um, and you could end up having weirdness there. Um, but still, it's, it's interesting having this binary format PHP file now that we have PHP 7. Another new feature that I really like is the abstract syntax tree. So it's an AST based, and it's part of the parsing step. And there's an extension called PHP AST that you can install that will expose this AST to user space, and you can do funky things with it. So if you take this line of PHP, so echo substring, ABC, and the Ray 1.2, this, when you dump the AST, you get a statement list, and it says, we have an echo, which is this echo, right? Then we have a function call, and the name of the function is substring. Name, F, name not FQ means the name is not fully qualified, meaning it doesn't have a namespace, a root namespace indicator. PHP defaults back to the root namespace in this case, but if I had put backslash substring, this would have been a fully qualified name. Um, then there's an argument list to that function call, and the argument list, the first is easy, it's just a string ABC. The second argument is an AST array node, and that has two elements, um, a one and a two. Now, obviously, the second argument to substring is not an array. So you can write stuff that will analyze the AST, and without executing PHP, you can tell that there's a syntax error here, right? So you can write an analyzer that walks the tree of nodes, and I've written one called fan, and when you run fan on this, it tells you that there's a tarp type error. It says argument two, which is the start index, is an integer array, but substring takes an int. So my fan tool has a big array of all the functions known to PHP, plus all the arguments and types that these functions take. And I look it up and say, hey, the substring, does that take these arguments? No, okay, throw an error. You can do lots of other funky things with, with an AST. Another new feature is that most fatal errors are now exceptions by default in PHP. So this is one that hits tons of people all the time you end up chaining stuff together, but you don't have any checks, um, any error checks along the way on the chain. So here, if I call method into this function call method, and I pass a null object, and I try to use this null object to call a method on it, 
right? That's obviously not going to work. So you get a fatal error, but it's an exception in this case, and exceptions also trigger a stack trace by default. So now you're going to get a stack trace that tells you exactly what you did. And you can catch it if you like. So in this case, I threw a try catch around it, and then I can handle it gracefully and do something useful with it here. Obviously, if you catch it, you're not going to get a stack trace unless you generate that yourself. Now, with these new exceptions, we didn't put it into the normal exception hierarchy because we didn't want code that was written to do sort of a catch, just exception. We didn't want the, that code to now suddenly catch all these new exceptions and then behave completely differently. And it's also a different type of exception. So we have now created sort of a sister hierarchy to the existing exception class um, called error. Both of these extend the throwable interface. So you can still, you can write a catch-all that catches everything by catching throwable, if you like. Catch-alls like that are not a great idea, so I wouldn't recommend it. And then within the error class, there are two subclasses. There's a type error and a parse error. So type errors come from the additional strict typing that's available in PHP 7, and parse errors are obvious. Um, you'll see a few of these in a bit. Part of this new typing in PHP 7 is we've added return types. The syntax is the return type is after the function definition, so you have a colon and then the type that this function is supposed to return. If you get it wrong, you get a fatal error, an exception. Um, and it's a type error exception, like we talked about, right? And it's telling me that it should be a type array, but an integer was returned in file on line two. Okay. On the actual arguments to functions, you can also do scalar typing now. We've had um, types for objects. Anything that was non-coercible, you could type in PHP 5. In PHP 7, you could now also type coercible types. So, and there are two modes, basically. There's the normal PHP approach to coercible types. You can throw the type in here, but by default, it will, it will turn these variables inside your function or method into the type that you specified by coercing the value, if it can. If it has trouble, you might get a notice. So here I have 2.5 bananas. It's supposed to be an integer. And you get a notice saying, this is not a very well-formed numeric value, right? Um, but other than that, it, it does what it can to do something sensible. You pass an integer one, it's going to give you a string one because you said you wanted a string. So normal PHP coursing rules apply here. You can also, before calling into something with types like this, you can say declare strict types. It's like, I want to know if I'm wrong. I want to know if I don't have the exact types needed. So in this case, we now get a fatal error, a type error. And we get that on the very first argument, saying argument one passed a log message, must be a type string, but we passed in an integer, right? Fix that, you're gonna get an error on the next one. Anonymous classes, just like anonymous functions, you can create throwaway classes essentially, pass them around, return them, whatever you do with anonymous functions, you can do with anonymous classes. We have a null coalesce operator. This one is to get rid of some of all the boilerplate code involved when doing is set or empty checks on things. So this one will not generate a notice on an undefined variable. So, and you can chain it together. Basically when you chain them, it means give me the first non-empty in the PHP sense of the term empty uh, expression in here. So A or B, Right, A is null, B is one, so you're gonna get one. C or B, C is two, so that's the first non-empty, you get two. A, B, or C, well, A is null, B is one, so you're gonna get B out. And in this case, A, X, or C, X isn't even defined, but you don't get a notice. A is null, X is not defined, C is two, so you get a two. That should reduce the number of times you need to do is sets and empties and stuff, checks up in your code. There's a new spaceship operator. 
My son says it's the Thai Advanced X1. <laughs> we had a bit of an argument back and forth on which spaceship it actually was. Um, what we found was we had a lot of bugs in user space code out there where people were not providing stable comparison functions. When you're sorting stuff, if A is less than B, then B should be greater than A. Um, but some people's comparison functions, you could have A is less than B, and then you check if B is less than A, and it'll also say yes. So, uh, and then the sort is gonna be messed up because it relies on stability in the comparison function. Um, so for people to not make that mistake, they can just use the spaceship operator now, and it'll do the right thing instead of having to write code like this, which people tend to mess up. Zero-cost assertions, another cool new feature. This one's a little tricky because it has three modes, and those modes can be a bit confusing. So the first mode, zero. Basically, don't enable assertions. So in this case, I have a function that asserts that the argument has to be between 20 and 110. So I pass in 16, which is obviously not going to pass, but assertions are turned off, nothing happens. On the second call, test 17, I've turned assertions on, and I get a warning. Um, assert, it's a fatal error, assertion error, and I get a stack trace off of it. That's with assertions turned on. Um, the minus one is interesting. This one you cannot do at runtime. You can only do it in your INI file. What this one does is it completely removes the assert opcode from the op array. So on the production system, you can throw all the asserts you want into your code and have that on in development, but in production, you might set it to minus one, and then there's absolutely no cost of having thousands and thousands of assert expressions in your code because it goes away in the opcode array that's cached, and it never actually gets anywhere near the execution time. At level zero, you still have all the opcodes, so the executor has to see that it's an assert, oh, asserts are off, I'm gonna to skip to the next one. So there's a little bit of a cost in skipping an assert with asserts off. Um, setting it to minus one, you get complete zero cost asserts. Closure call, this is basically just a shortcut. If you have a closure, you need to rebind the class that the closure is bound to. You could do that before with a bind to. Now you can just do a straight call the closure, but call it with this class, and it'll automatically bind to that. Oops. I've, we've removed a whole bunch of PHP 4 features. Um, you can read this one yourself. It's the, most of them you should not have been using for the last 12 years. <laughs> um, so if you're still using a lot of these, then there's some problems. There are a few that you're probably using, and I'll cover those in a bit. Also, if you have a class named string, you're gonna have to change it. Um, same with all these other. So these words are now reserved. They weren't reserved in, in PHP 5. You could actually create a class with these names. Can't do that anymore. Some cleanups on uh, underflows, overflows, edge cases when coming, when dealing with integer stuff. And this one's interesting. If you're doing octals, in PHP 5, if you have an invalid value in your octal number, so 0, 8, 8 is not a valid value in an octal, right? 0 through 7 is valid. Um, in PHP 5, it just stops parsing as soon as it sees an invalid, and then just sets the value to whatever it parsed up until then. So in this case, mask would be 0. No warnings, no notices. You probably don't even know your code is broken, but your mask is going to be 0. In PHP 7, this is a parse error. Um, and it won't even compile, you're, you're stuck because it makes no sense. And it makes it easy to find these problems in your code because these are obviously bugs. The other big one that's gonna bite you, and I'll talk more about that, is the uniform variable syntax. Because of our switch to an AST, we had to make everything consistent in the parser. Everything is now left to right, which means that if you have something like this, this belongs to a column. In PHP 5, this was actually parsed as if you had a local belongs to variable inside this, and then if that was an array, you would 
dereferenced the array, and that value then became the name of the property. In PHP 7, it goes completely left to right. So it looks for a belongs to property on this object, and then it applies the index. If you want the old behavior, you have to add in curly braces and saying, well, dereference this part first, which is probably a good idea to do anyway. And it won't break your PHP 5 code to go in and do that now, but it makes it explicit what you mean here, because this can be read two different ways, right, if you're not familiar with the rules. Um, there's a new Unicode code point syntax. So you can do backslash u and then put the code point in to put stuff up. And there's also an ICU Intel char extend or class added to the Intel extension, if you know what the Intel char is. Hopefully, we were supposed to have it out this week, which is why the timing of this talk was supposed to co be coordinated with the release, but didn't quite make it. We hit a couple of nasty bugs in our last release candidate, so we had to extend it. Either we're gonna hit the Thursday on November 26th, or else then the next scheduled release Thursday is December 12th after that. We could also make a special exception and pick the Thursday in between here. Um, we'll see, we'll see how this current release candidate is going, but we're very, very close at this point. It's a matter of days now, not months anymore. All right, so this 100% performance improvement, some people, uh, people should be a little bit skeptical, I think, because PHP has been around for over 20 years. And it is a bit of magic to take something that old and suddenly make it twice as fast. I mean, were we complete idiots for 20 years to not find <laughs> the sleep 10 that was sitting right there? <laughs> but we weren't actually idiots. The code was pretty good. It was pretty fast as it was. It took this massive effort from three guys, Dimitri, Chen Chen, and Nikita, who sat down and just pounded away at this for all of 2014. They were just destroying it and going through and finding tiny little things here and there and just thousands of tiny optimizations. And they started with WordPress. So they started with WordPress 3.6 on this old machine and they ran 100 requests against the front page and they came up with um, the time, so it's at 26 seconds in January of 2014. By December 2014, they had that down to 12 seconds for the same stuff. And if you look at the number of instructions, it took 9 billion instructions to serve up those 100 pages. By the end of it, it took 2.9 billion instructions. So that's like saying, well, here's this 20-year-old project. You are now only allowed one-third of the instructions to do exactly the same thing and not break millions and millions of lines of legacy code out there. But we're going to delete two out of three lines of code, essentially. <laughs> right? And two out of three instructions are going to get tossed away. Make it still work and don't break anything. That's an almost impossible task. But they did a really, really good job on it. Some of the things they did was the CVAL, which is kind of the basic unit in PHP, it's um, a union uh, inside a struct inside PHP, was shrunk from 24 to 16 bytes. Hash table size, 72 to 56, and the bucket size, which is each element in an array, went from 72 to 32 bytes. And then also a bunch of optimization. So this piece of code here in PHP 5 takes 43 megs of memory. So we go through and we create, we basically append an array, or we make a nested array with a bunch of immutable strings in there. And that took 43 megabytes in PHP 5. It takes six megabytes in PHP 7 to do the same thing. So there's some massive, if you're doing certain types of code, you're gonna see some massive shrinkage of memory use. Other types of code, not so much. If you don't happen to hit a combination of our optimizations. If you're doing massive database queries with huge result sets, then yeah, I mean, if you're loading megabytes and megabytes of just strings, there's not that much we can do to shrink your strings, right? You're gonna have to do that yourself. Tons of other things, much more CPU cache friendly. Um, some, we stole some tricks from J.E. Malloc for our allocator. 
Now, we don't need all the locking and stuff because we're not multi-threaded, but there are still some really good ideas in JE malloc that we borrowed. Um, faster hash table iteration, a bunch of other things. There's also a few things that only kick in if you're using a modern GCC. So if you're compiling your own, I would make sure you're using at least GCC 4.8 to build it, or you're not going to get global register variables and a couple of other things that modern GCCs bring to you. We also added huge page support in opcache. These aren't THP, the transparent huge pages. That's the bane of many sysadmins' lives because it does weird crap to code that's not expecting huge pages. This is explicit huge pages where you configure the machine and says, I'm going to allocate this much huge page space, and then you tell PHP to use it, basically, and opcache will go ahead and use it if you configure it to do so. So opcache huge pages, you set how much memory you want it to use, and it's going to go and grab huge pages. And you can check that with a cat proc mem info on, on, Unix to, or on Linux to make sure it's actually grabbing those huge pages correctly. And you'll get between like five and eight percent speed up by using huge pages. There's no JIT in PHP 7. Basically what we've done is we've taken the guts of PHP and just made it super, super fast. And we've also made some changes that will allow us to go down the JIT path. So right now there is nothing that is optimizing, optimizing hotspots in code, which is what a JIT is good for. It finds hotspots in the code and it will speed up those critical sections. Once we add a JIT to PHP 7, we can expect another boost because we haven't played our JIT card yet. But it's hard to write a JIT, so it's going to take a while. It's, it's really hard to write a bad JIT. It's almost impossible to write a good JIT. <laughs> so, some benchmarks. Please don't believe my benchmarks. I, I did my best. Um, I don't really have any reason to lie on them, but who knows? There could be mistakes in there. I did have a German magazine reproduce them because he came back and asked me a bunch of questions, and he couldn't reproduce the numbers initially. And it turns out that he didn't have opcache turned on. <laughs> so once he did that, he, he actually came back and said, my numbers are almost identical to yours, but he had matched the hardware specs of my machine and everything. He, he went crazy. <laughs> so, because I, I published all my specs here, so he had found a machine with almost the same specs and everything, so um, he did get the same numbers. But everything you need to reproduce these benchmarks are in here, configuration, specs, and everything. So, some numbers. This is Drupal 8, which is also being released soon. Works quite well with PHP 7. PHP 5.5 at 20 concurrent requests hitting it, we're getting 1360 uh, requests per second. PHP 5.6, a little higher, 1379. PHP 7, 1974. And HHVM 310 at 1982. So there's basically a, a dead heat between them here. If we change the concurrency a little bit, go up to 40 concurrent clients, numbers are pretty much the same. Go down in concurrency a little bit, Turns out PHP 7 is a little faster at lower concurrencies. I'm not actually quite sure why, um, but they're, they're pretty close. Latency-wise, get rid of uh, these. So latency at 10 concurrent clients, latency at 20, right? So we've dropped from 14.7 milliseconds down to 10.1 milliseconds here, which is a decent drop. Now, we didn't quite get 2x, right? Not quite 2x on, on Drupal 8. 13 to 1900 is not 2x. So we, we can't get it on everything. WordPress. Now, WordPress is fun because WordPress is kind of the benchmark that both the PHP 7 team and the HHVM team have been using. So you can see from if you're running PHP 5.3, you're going to get more than 3x performance out of both PHP 7 and HHVM because both teams have been using that and optimizing the crap out of the style of code that WordPress uses, basically. Because it's simple and it's easy to, to reason about. Um, and latency-wise as well, latency has dropped from 100 milliseconds down to 30-some milliseconds, right? Which is pretty impressive. But we are competitive and we, s we looked at that and going, man, what the hell? Or at least I did. Like, why are we just 
just slightly behind HHVM here. I need a trick. I need to cheat. <laughs> so my cheat was a cool GCC feature called FDO, which is feedback directed optimization. So you can compile uh, PHP and you use this profgen flag that says, I'm going to produce a version of a PHP binary that's going to generate profiling data. Then you run that profiling version of PHP against the code that you want to speed up. So in this case, you can use PHP CGI minus T, which repeats the request however many times you want. So in this case, I'm doing a thousand times on the WordPress front page. Then you do make prof clean, and then you recompile PHP and say prof use. So it's going to then use this profiling data that you collected from executing the profiling version over WordPress. And it's going to incorporate that and hopefully speed things up. Now, it'll probably slow down your PHP if you then run it on something that's not WordPress, right? Um, but if you run it against WordPress, what we see is that <laughs> I went from 626 to 658, and HH Ramos is 656, so just <laughs> by a nose. But, but statistically, I mean, it's within the marginal error of, on my testing, so it, it's a dead heat, essentially. But there's no reason not to try it, right? If you are a shop, if you're a shop that has a single monolithic application of some kind, and that's all you run, or if you're a Drupal shop, or if you're whatever, why not build a PHP that runs your particular stack really, really well? If you're an ISP that runs everything, no, don't do it. But if you're not, why not? Why not build a PHP that is optimized for your particular style of code? All right, more benchmarks. PHP BB. Here, PHP 7 flies. We get our 2x, even though we're PHP 5.6, we, we get to our 2x benchmark. HHVM is lagging behind a little bit on PHP BB. MediaWiki, the HHVM team has done a lot of work on um, optimizing for MediaWiki. Um, so they're ahead. I didn't try FDO on this one. We're too far behind. I don't think I'll catch it anyway. Uh, but, I mean, it's still 2x. It's at least 2x over PHP 5.5, 5, 140 to 280, right? So it's still a huge jump for MediaWiki. OpenCart, here you can see we all have some trouble. <laughs> we are not getting much of a speed up. We, we see a little bit of a speed up, but not much. And this is because OpenCart spends all of its time in the database. It's just tons and tons of database queries. Lots of them are full table scans. We're not going to speed up your database, sorry. Right? If, if you're spending all your CPU time in the database, well, that's it. <laughs> uh, wardrobe CMS, this one I picked up because it was a Laravel application with some Symfony stuff in there, which is representative of a lot of people's current style of PHP coding. And it runs that code extremely well. Um, and here we have almost a 3x increase over PHP 5 for that. Geeklog. Another random app I just grabbed from GitHub. And you'll notice that I just, I just grabbed these and they worked. I didn't have to modify them for the most part. Um, all of these, just I installed them and they worked, which is fun because you can get this instant upgrade without doing any work most likely. We'll see. So Magento 2 runs really well as well on PHP 7. Track, this was one that did break on PHP 7 and I had to go and fix. And it was this uniform variable syntax thing. And I actually took the example from my slide right out of this application. It had this exact stuff in there. I put them in my two braces and track started working. And I did submit it back to the project so it is fixed. If you now download track, it'll work nicely. The nice thing about the fix is that it's not PHP 7 specific. It doesn't break PHP 5, right? Cache is the status indicator app. Um, it runs really well on PHP 7 as well. Moodle, couldn't get this one working on HHVM, but Moodle is educational stuff. My son's high school runs on Moodle, or my son's school runs on Moodle. Um, you probably have kids, or some of you are young enough to maybe use <laughs> Moodle yourselves. <laughs> um, so I think the Moodle folks are gonna be extremely happy because Moodle is a bit of a, a, a slow application. So I think they'll be ecstatic about getting onto PHP 7. Zencart, another shopping application. 
that spends a lot of time in the database. So you're not gonna see 2x performance on that. All right, that's performance. Memory use. Memory use is a little tricky to measure. Um, I mean, you can do a PS and you can look at virtual RSS, um, and just size with data segment, size of the process, and resident set size, but it's not a very good indicator because shared libraries and everything is in there. Um, and top basically shows you the same thing. And it, I don't like either of these tools. I prefer something called SMEM. And SMEM has this, damn it. SMEM has this uh, concept of proportion, proportional set size where it looks at the shared space or the shared libraries and the shared data um, and then it spreads that shared data evenly across the processes. So RSS is everything. And you can't just add it up. So if I'm running 10 PHP processes, I can't just add up the 10 RSS numbers and get 75, because it's not using 75. A bunch of this stuff is shared among the 10 processes. So that doesn't make any sense. The unique set size, this is everything without any shared stuff, which also isn't accurate because it needs all these shared libraries to, to operate, so that is using memory. So to me, the best compromise is to take the PSS and add it up. Um, so I'm basically saying that I'm taking 6.1 megabytes of memory here, just for PHP FPM, just sitting there with 10 processes is my memory use. If I then start hitting Drupal, that grows up to 12.9 megabytes as I'm hitting the Drupal front page or a Drupal node, I don't remember what I was doing. Um, so that's how I'm measuring memory on these next set of graphs. So here, the base memory use has dropped a little bit. This is without any request having hit PHP yet. You start up PHP, in this case, 10 PHP FPM processes, and it sits and it uses about 6.1 megs of memory with all the sets of extensions that I had loaded into my, my test box here which is down a little bit from others, but it really doesn't matter. The base use is almost irrelevant. What matters is how much, use does, how much memory does you use once you start executing code? How efficient are we at executing code? So here we are on Drupal 8. 33 megs on the PHP 5.4. We got a bit worse on the 5.5, up to 44, down to 41, but 12.9 on the PHP 7. Right. WordPress basically doesn't need memory at all. <laughs> at least compared to earlier versions of PHP, it drops into like zero almost because, again, WordPress has been our benchmark, right? So we're looking at all the patterns WordPress uses, like how can we make this use less memory? And we really did. We kind of made it disappear. So that's 93 from PHP 5.6 down to 15 megs of memory. PHP BB, here we didn't get down very much. There's a lot of hitting the database and getting like rows for the form um, out of it. So this is the style that just doesn't use a lot less memory in PHP 7. Moodle, again, WordPress-like in how they allocate memory and how they use arrays and stuff. So it almost disappears. Wardrobe CMS, again, memory use dropped by a ton. Um, so I didn't do all of them, but in general, you're going to see a big drop in memory Worst case, it won't drop very much at all. It might drop just 10%. Best case, you'll get 300% less memory needed. All right, so things that'll actually bite you once you start migrating to this super fast, cool version of PHP. There's a full list here, php.net migration 7.0, which you should definitely read before you start migrating anything critical. The top three, we've covered this one. It's the left to right semantics. If you have complicated expressions like this, like dollar, dollar, foo, bar, bass, stuff like this, but even reading it as a human, you can't quite see what does this actually do? Like how does it, how does it expand? Um, and this now expands left to right. So it's going to expand dollar, dollar, foo, then it's gonna apply bar, then it's gonna apply bass, right? Um, it doesn't do that in PHP 5. It, does this essentially, where it does dollar foo all this, and then it does a dollar on top of that. It basically, so it's whatever the contents of foo bar bass is, that's now the name of the variable, right? That's not the same as this. So you have to be very careful of that. 
and a static analyzer can detect it. Um, you can grep around for complicated expressions as well. Um, or your unit tests, if you have any, will probably fail. <laughs> Second one that might bite you is we've removed slash E from PREG. Slash E is an eval that basically runs PHP code on the matched um, expression. And this is not a very smart thing to do because <laughs> many times you're doing this stuff on user supplied data. And then you have to worry about how do I make this safe within an eval uh, inside a regular expression and that gets super, super hairy. Um, so this was a concession to security. We say, okay, let's just drop the feature altogether. It does mean that this is a line from my own presentation system that's running this, uh, uh, this presentation. And I had this in here. So I had these special indicators that say colon dash colon city, for example. And it then puts the name of the city I'm currently giving a talk in into my slides. So I don't have to redo my slides when I, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I have these properties in my presentation. That's just the name of the city and it just puts it in nicely. Um, super easy to read, very handy. This of course broke when I changed to PHP 7. So what you have to do is use a callback. So you do a prec replace callback and you do the same thing. That callback is gonna get you a list of matches and then I can take match number one, which is the same thing that this syntax does, match number one, and I can grab that. But of course, be careful. Right? Because of the left to right stuff we talked about, the uniform variable syntax, I have to put, because I actually want matches as the variable here, not the matches property on press. Um, I want that um, parsed this way. So detection, grep, basically uh, warnings and logs, but it's not that hard to look for prec replace and other prec functions and look for slash e. And the octal literals now. And again, that's easy to find. You can just lint it. PHP minus L will catch these for you. So I talked a little bit about static analysis. I've hacked together a very quick static analysis. Well, it's not, it doesn't run that quick, but I, it didn't take me long to write the static <laughs> analyzer. Um, it's currently undergoing some rewriting, and I have a feeling we're going to see a lot of static analysis tools coming out in the next 12, 18 months for PHP 7 because the AST is sitting there and it's so enticing to start doing things to this tree of nodes. Um, previously, you'd have to generate your own AST and that's a three month project just getting the damn AST right. Now, when you get the AST for free and you know it's always right because PHP itself uses it internally, then it's a lot more enticing to start parsing this AST and doing things to it. So some things it can do, you basically, give it a list of files and it'll go through and find stuff. In this case, I just ran it on my display.php for this presentation. The minus B flag says find me any BC issues from PHP 5 to PHP 7 and it came up and says compat error. So initially I made the mistake myself. I just put dollar matches one in here and it didn't work. I'm like, why didn't it work? I was like, this is, does it know I'm Rasmus? It's just, just do what I say, damn it. <laughs> so it's a little bit embarrassing when, when I get mistakes like that, but we all make mistakes, right? So I ran my fan on it and fan came up right away and said, hey, compat error, this expression may not be PHP 7 compatible, right? So it catches this pattern and uh, basically indicates right where it was and then it was easy to find after that. Um, if you, you can download, so in this case I downloaded uh, Jordy's monologue from GitHub and just had a look at it. Um, I generate a file list. Usually I just do um, find dot, find everything, find all the dot PHP files, stick them in a text file. I usually remove all the unit tests and stuff and then I run the static analyze on everything except all PHP code all other than the tests. And for monologue it didn't actually find that many issues, just 21. A couple of expressions that may not be PHP 7 compatible, and then a couple of things where he had PHP doc types in there um, that didn't match the code. So I could file a 
a bug report or PR with him to have him fix his, his type errors in there. But this is the type of output you can expect from a static analyzer, where it goes through and makes sure that all your types are correct and you don't have anything weird happening. And this could be a precursor to turning on strict types in your code. Because if you currently have PHP doc comments with the types in there, the static analyzer will see those and use them. And then once that's all clean from a static analyzer point of view, you could then start thinking about maybe making those actual hard strict types in your code. Um, but you need, if you have a lot of legacy code, you need some way of getting from where you are to, to strict or typing. And this would be one way of doing it. All right, how do we deploy this? I see a lot of mistakes. Almost everyone I talk to and I ask them how they deploy their code, they're doing it wrong. And it's a bit frustrating for me because this should not be hard. It really should not be hard to deploy code. So some things you want to make sure. You want to make sure your deploys are atomic. And we'll talk more about what that means. And you also don't want a performance hit. Here at Etsy, we're big on continuous integration and we deploy tens of times a day. Sometimes 10, 20, 30. On really busy days, we can hit 40 or 50 deploys per day. Um, and you don't want people to worry about deploying. You shouldn't be sitting there going, oh, I have this fix, I have this bug fix, but we're in the busy time. If I deploy now, everything is going to slow down. I'm going to affect customers. If that's your thinking, your deploy system is broken. You should be able to deploy even at peak traffic and it should not have any impact at all on your service if your deploy system works correctly. And most people don't. And they should. It's not hard to do. So for a decent deploy system, you don't want to have to restart everything because when you restart stuff, you kill your caches and everything has to repopulate and that's slow. We don't want slow. Pulling servers out of your load balancer, again, then you're decreasing your capacity, which if you're doing this at peak, you suddenly you pull half your servers out of the load balancer, bad idea, right? No thundering herd issues, so you don't want to have to, you don't want to deploy tons of new code that's not in any cache because then suddenly all these requests coming in are gonna cause a thundering herd to repopulate the caches. So you wanna make sure you invalidate the minimum amount of cache, cached entries as possible by reusing them, obviously. From a, an atomic perspective, if you think about your web server and you have an existing document root that's currently serving your site, var www.a, right? You have a bunch of requests underway at any point in time. And then at some point, you want to say, okay, we're going to deploy. And these requests that are already running are going to be at various states. Now, when you flip that symlink over to B, well, first we, first we have to sort of assume that this is how we deploy, right? That, that we write all the new files to a new directory, right? Um, hopefully the deploy system does not just overwrite your existing files in your document root, because that's a really bad idea, right? So the, the, I guess that's step one, is make sure you're not overwriting files from your production document root. Write it to a new directory. Writing this to a new directory, and at some point when everything's written and your new directory is fine, your new code is there, you can flip the symlink. But when you flip that symlink over, you don't want requests that are currently running A to then suddenly be on B. Because if it's just before an include, and now that include is going to grab a new version that's not compatible with your existing code that's been running up to this point in that request, you have a problem. So, what actually needs to happen is that you need, to, you need the ability to run two versions of your site at any time. So you flip the symlink over to B, all the requests that started on A have to finish on A. And then all new requests that start after the symlink flip have to start on B. And both sites, essentially, have to run concurrently. Which from a PHP perspective, it doesn't care, right? It, it's fine as long as it has files that it reads and it can include files and execute them, it's fine. So this is all at the file system level. You have to make sure, obviously, you don't delete A at any point along the way, right? And you flip the symlink over and all the files are in B and all new requests start there. 
And the very, very, very simple trick to doing that, to make sure that request that begin on A, finish on A, is just to set the document root to the target of the symlink. So at the web server level, when the web server says, okay, here's a request, what's my document root? Well, let's look at the symlink. The document root is A, great. Here, PHP, your document root is A, go nuts. If all your code is including things relative to the document root, it's gonna keep going on A, because even if you flip that symlink later, that PHP code doesn't know. It thinks its document root is A. The document root was set to A for that, right? So now, you flip the symlink, and the requests start coming in, and now the web server says, hey, your, your document root is B. And you might have requests that finish on B before some requests manage to finish on A, which is okay. There's no problem with that, right? It's really, really easy to do with Nginx. Nginx has thought ahead and they have this feature. This is, you can set the document root to real path underscore root, like that, and it'll automatically do that for you. Apache does not have this feature, so I wrote an extension or module for Apache called mod real doc that does exactly that, does the same as Nginx does, and you can get it on GitHub at C mod real doc. Some caveats, you obviously don't want to hard code your paths. So if we look at this picture, you don't want to hard code anything to like var dub dub dub. If, if var dub 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 doc root is your actual symlink that you're flipping back and forth, nothing should hard code that directory name because then it's going to defeat the purpose of the symlink. Make everything relative to document root and you're fine. And most apps do that already anyway. Make sure you also don't have hard-coded path in your include path. If you do, Kayer here at Etsy wrote an extension for PHP that can do the same thing to your include path that we do for the document root. So basically, if it sees var dub dub uh, doc root, and then it looks at the target of the symlink, and then replaces that in your include path to var dub dub a or var dub dub b, based on where that symlink is pointing. So that's what ink path does. Make sure that all your static assets are versioned, right? So usually you don't serve static assets off of the same web server instance as you do dynamic stuff like PHP. You might even have a CDN. Just make sure everything is versioned and you won't have any trouble. DB schema changes, this doesn't solve that. So if you suddenly wipe out a column from your database schema, yeah, th there is no way that you can do that and have the old code and the new code running concurrently because the old code is expecting the column to be there, the new code isn't, so that's not going to work. So any sort of shared resources like that, you have to be careful about. And it might simply mean that you do it in a couple of deploys. You, you, you start changing the code to not expect the column to be there anymore, deploy that once that's running um, and completely done deploying and there are no more old requests then you can remove it and then you deploy the new code to remove the old code and stuff like that, right? So you do it in a couple of deploys, maybe write a migration script to, to get the data moved across. Um, this doesn't solve that, but it does solve your atomicity problems and it makes sure that you have as little downtime or effect on your production servers as possible from your deploy system. And it's not hard to do. Oh, and the final thing I didn't really highlight was don't write a new directory every time. Just fl flip between two. Flip between an A and a B. And rsync your new version. So now I've, I'm on B. My next version is going to get rsync on top of A. So only my changed files will need to be recached in this case. Um, there are deploy tools out there, um, some Ruby-based ones that always make a new directory with a timestamp on it. So Every time you deploy, you, you haven't restarted, so you don't have an empty cache, but you don't have any hits. It's all misses because you have completely new files, right? Usually, especially if you're doing continuous integration, you're only changing a small percentage of your files on any one deploy. So there's no 
reason to invalidate all those other files that are already cached. So just overwrite your existing ones. If you really need a copy of, of a certain version, make that part of the deploy process. Make a copy of A or B and put the timestamp on it and squirrel it away in the backup somewhere if that's what you want. We don't do that at Etsy. We don't have a, a one button go back to the previous version. We always move forward. So we don't really have a use for, for older um, timestamped versions of the site, but some, I know some companies do that. All right, and the final thing, <clears throat> um, I've come up with a vagrant image that you can use to test your stuff. If you don't feel like compiling your own PHP or waiting for your distro to give you a PHP 7 package, you can git clone straight from my PHP 7 dev thing on GitHub. CD PHP 7 dev, Vagrant up. You'll need Vagrant and VirtualBox installed on whatever OS you're on. It should work everywhere. Linux, Windows, Mac, whatever you might be on, it should work if you can get those two installed on there. This takes a little bit of time because it needs to download over a gig of stuff. Um, then Vagrant SSH and you should get a prompt in the box. Passwords to everything is Vagrant. Root password is Vagrant. The username is Vagrant. Um, by default, you'll get this IP address, 192.168.77, um, but also in DHCP one for you. And if you hit it, you should get a PHP 7 PHP info page if everything's working. And inside that, you now have tons of PHP versions as well. I've pre-compiled 24 versions of it in PHP 5.3, both in debug, debug threaded and threaded mode, and obviously non-debug as well. Um, there's a PHP 7.1, which is very similar to PHP 7.0 at this point, but we did do the branch for 7.0, and there are a few new things in 7.1, so you can start playing with 7.1, but there's no real point yet. Six months from now, that might be interesting. You can also rebuild PHP, which is probably the first thing you should do. I, I only release a new Vagrant image once every couple of months, so it gets behind pretty quickly. Just type make PHP 7. Once you Vagrant SSH, type make PHP 7. It's going to pull the latest code and it's going to compile it for you. You don't have to figure out how to do it. Just type that. We'll do the right thing. If you want to build it yourself, you can also CD into PHP source. And there are these CN files, which is the config, just a little text file with all the config flags. So there's a CN 5.6 for all the flags needed to configure PHP 5.6. And you can compile that way. It's a really good way, if you're writing extensions for PHP, it's a really good way of testing your extension on many different versions of PHP, because that can be a bit annoying um, to switch back and forth. Um, and to switch, you simply type new PHP. Like new PHP 5.6, new PHP 7.0, new PHP 7.1, and it'll automatically switch everything, the Apache, um, Nginx, PHP FTM setup, command line, everything will switch to that version just very, very quickly like that. All right, those are the links we talked about. Bugs, bugs, bugs. Please, please, please file some useful bug reports once you start playing with this. It's a little late in the process, but even late bug reports are good. And if it's really complicated, it'd be very, very nice if you could simplify it down to like a sample script, or if you can't do that, a set of steps, maybe against my PHP 7 dev image, that would be useful, saying, okay, on the PHP 7 dev image, grab these things from GitHub, these set of steps to reproduce things, instead of just a, hey, this crap doesn't work, fix it, <laughs> right? We, we need a little bit more, we've spent a lot of time on this, it'd be very nice if you guys could spend a little bit of time as well on your bug reports, so. Thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs> questions? Yeah, we'll take maybe just a handful of questions. It's up to you. And then Rasmus will stick around, and you're all welcome to stick around as well and ask more, come on up. But uh, yeah, we can take a handful of questions first from the audience. Hello, Rasmus. Hi. Um, since we don't have the git, the JIT on as HHVM does, uh, what gain do we have from using static static variables, static type? 
like integers, like we do on hack. If you're typing the same script on PHP 7 and hack using statically typed variables, it's much faster. Uh, right. Is that coming with maybe sometime in the future with it, with the JIT? Um, well, obviously a JIT can make use of that. So we have, I mean, we've gotten all these performance increases without doing all those JIT things. Without a JIT, we can't make much use of that. That's true. And that's why I say that once we add a JIT, we, you can expect to see another big, big boost in performance because we haven't played that card yet, right? So let's say you want to move to strict types eventually, but you're going to start off with Coercer because you don't want to crash the site. Right. Um, is there any way of logging when coercion occurs so you can fix those portions of your site? Not really. I mean, with static analysis, you can get that easily, right? Um, we don't have a mode that says assume it's strict, but don't apply it, just log. No, we, we don't have that mode. You could do it in dev, right? You could add them in. You saw the two modes, right? Um, uh, here. So what you could do is in dev, you could add declare strict types, right? And then you're going to, not, you're going to get logs, you're going to get fatal errors on everything. Um, and then you can go sort of file by file. And then once you've converted the file over, then you can start saying, okay, this can now, this now does, sends all the correct types to the underlying strictly type library. We can now turn this and add declare strict types in this particular file. So you can do sort of a slow, gradual thing as you audit and, and figure out that, hey, th this piece of the code is now strict enough. Then you can add in this one line, declare strict types equals one. So you can do it that way, maybe. All right. One. Well, was there another? Just two? One back there? Maybe I missed it in your presentation at the very end. Um, what's the best way to include relative paths for includes to make sure the opcode caches are done properly, and I don't only mean going down the path, but going up and, you know. Uh, so, like <clears throat> the opcode cache, opcache, the version we're using with PHP 7 and also with PHP 5.5 and up, it uses um, real paths. So it uses the fully qualified path as the index in it. So, you don't really need to do anything special. You can require dot dot slash type stuff it's going to real path the thing and use the actual full path on the file system as the, as the index. So I don't think you have to worry very much about that. I know under uh, APC and, and previous caches, because of the way we did things, that mattered. Under opcache, it doesn't matter. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Feel free to stick around. There's drinks and snacks and Rasmus. So <laughs> uh, get your fill. And thank you again. Thanks, Rasmus. Thank you.